Today is Father's Day, and churches around the world have designated this day as a time to honor our earthly fathers. It has been celebrated in Europe since the Middle Ages on St. Joseph's Day in March, the day of honoring Joseph as the earthly father of Jesus. It came to North America by a woman named Sonora Smart Dodd, who wanted to honor her father. Sonora's mother had passed away, and her father raised her and five siblings as a single dad. She first brought it to the YMCA in Spokane, Washington in 1920. But it was only made an official holiday in the U.S by President Richard Nixon in 1972. We too in Canada take this day to honor our fathers. The scripture tells us that God is our father. The following scriptures were posted on a church website. Pastor Dan thought that this was an excellent compilation of 10 favorite scriptures about our father in heaven. All but two of them were spoken directly by Jesus himself. May you experience his love as you hear the truth about your heavenly Father. Number 10. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? Matthew 6. Verse 9. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders off, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go to look for the one that has wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth. He is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. From Matthew 18. The eighth favorite scripture. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Luke 6. Verse number 7. Do not be afraid, little flock. Your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Luke 12. Verse number 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. John 14. Down to verse number 5. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. John 16. Verse number four, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Romans 8. Verse number three, which of you... If his son asks for bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake. If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give, give good gifts to those who ask him? Matthew 7. Verse number 2. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. 1 John 3. And what is the message that all these verses have been hammering into our hearts? You have a Father who loves you. 
He is strong enough to protect you. He is engaged enough to teach you. He is tender enough to hug you. And he is alive enough to play with you. And the number one verse regarding the love of the Father is this amazing truth. No matter how far you have wandered, you can still come home. Regarding the prodigal son, Jesus tells us, verse 1, When he came to his senses, he said, I will set out and go back to my father. Luke 15. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yes, it's Father's Day. And there's lots of family celebrations that are happening right now at campsites. And after this service, there's a bunch of you that are going to be gathering together. Lots of steak is going to be barbecued today. And uh, gifts and appreciation comments. And uh, the scripture does honor this idea of father. It uses the word father as one of the descriptors of God. Now, uh, last Sunday, we talked about the limitations of Scripture in describing God to us. How does the Scripture take the, the idea of, of this heavenly being and make it available to us who are completely different order? We are simply humans, and we have to uh, use human language to be able to understand these heavenly concepts. So actually, if you missed last Sunday's message, I would encourage you to go to our church website, and there's a place there where you can click on to hear the messages. Every Sunday, we record these messages, and we use the PowerPoints, and we make a little video out of them so that you can actually hear the message and see the slides that are being done here. And we spent a bit of time last week talking about the, the use of metaphor. And in the scripture, God uses this word, Father, as a word that we can understand. And whenever we hear this word father, it brings to mind instantly certain qualities. Likely, the qualities that your father exhibited. And that's where the limitations show up. Because when it comes to metaphors in scripture, the, metaf the scripture uses these words and images that we can understand, and that helps us. But, the metaphors rely on the experience that you have had with that metaphor. And that can be a problem. In fact, preparing for this message, I watched a number of videos online about Father's Day. And there was one of them that was quite poignant on this very matter of an imperfect metaphor. It was a video by a man who was raised as a foster child and had been to a number of homes. And when he came to church as an adult and they said, God is your father, he wondered, well, what father are you talking about? Because he had fathers that were caring and fathers that ignored him. He had fathers who were gentle and those who were abusive. He had fathers who believed in him and some who said, you'll never amount to anything. And as far as his own biological father, he said, well, he's been a no-show all my life. So he said, when you say God's my father, what kind of a father are you talking about? And that is a problem. Our experience of the metaphor will color what we understand that to be. And here's the problem. Nobody is a perfect dad. Now, my image of my father started out very well. My father, actually, my, the image of my father has changed over the years. At first, when I was young, I idolized him. He was the best dad ever. And I deeply respected him. And in fact, this morning, uh, he gave me a call and was congratulating me on Father's Day. And I was able to say back to him, Dad, you were a good dad for me. And my memories of how you led our family and how you were a man of God and how you prayed at home and how you preached the word with passion, 
Those were good memories. And dad, you made it easy for me to understand God as my father. And I want to thank you. I was able to say that to my dad this morning. However, when I grew up, I came to find out that he was an ordinary human being. And he wasn't perfect. And that his image of being God the Father is not complete. And there's no way he could be complete. Because no person is a perfect dad. We all do our best, but we don't give the perfect image of it. And so as we grow up and we begin to realize some of these painful things that maybe dads weren't perfect or maybe dads were even very difficult for us, we have to come to the point of recognizing we got to forgive our dads. Yes, they have shortcomings. And actually, those dads that were abusive or that were difficult, if you were to ask them their story and find out about what they experienced from their dad, you might find that there were some difficulties for them. And often, the phrase is, hurting people hurt people. And so there's this, this needing to forgive our dads, and we have to come to the point of, of not blaming them for not being what they couldn't be, because they can't be perfect. Now, when they get it right, when dads do it right, wow, it is very helpful. It gives us a good idea of God. I recall times when I was younger, and uh, when we come back from boarding school, we would come home, and I love being home because home was where mom and dad were. And I remember in numbers of times, I would walk into dad's office there at the seminary. He'd be studying there at his desk and have all his books out. When I would walk into that office there and begin to talk to him about a project or something I wanted to do, all the books went to the side. And he talked to me about this project. And if it was a little thing we were working on, he would work on the desk. He had, a few, he had a few tools in his top drawer there. He would take out the screwdrivers and stuff. We'd work on the little thing that we were doing there. But at the time, I didn't realize how significant that was. But when I was older and I look back on that, I say, well, that was pretty good. He was busy. But he stopped. And he turned to me and he gave me his attention. He modeled Christian living for me. And I'm thankful for these things. However, my understanding of God as my father has been changing over the years. And now in my more senior years, I'm beginning to see God as my father in fresh and new ways. And the way I've been able to see God in better ways than even a good father on earth is by understanding and thinking about the Trinity. Last Sunday, we looked at this trinity, and here is a, a conceptual diagram that helps us understand a little bit about this. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the names that are given, the, the metaphorical names that are given here are relationship names. You can't be a son unless you have a father. You can't be a father unless you have a son. And the spirit of this relationship is the essence of what it means to be, have a spirit in the family. These three beings together form this unique and mysterious being that we call God. Now, what I'd like to do this morning is to take a little bit of time to look at the relationship about the Son and the Father. Let's look at that relationship a little bit more. And for that, I want to ask you to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and beginning at verse 25. Jesus is in a public setting where this is happening. He has just uh, pronounced woe on unrepentant cities who were not received of him. And it seems like he was standing there with the disciples around him, and he breaks into prayer, and he says... I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. 
And so from talking to his father, he stops and he turns to his disciples and he says, for all things have been committed to me by my father. No one knows the son except the father. And no one knows the father except the son and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. So he's just been in prayer with his father. The disciples are all watching this. And he stops and he says, no one knows me like the father. And no one knows the father like me. And the Greek word that is used there means an experiential, first-hand, face-to-face knowledge. He says, no one has seen me experientially, face-to-face, first-hand, like the Father. And no one knows the Father like I know him. And then listen to the last phrase there. He says, and to those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Wow. Talking to his disciples, he is revealing the Father to them. And then he says, you know, if you begin to get this, folks, you begin to understand this relationship between Son and Father, he said, come, come to me, all you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in spirit, in heart, and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And folks, we are burdened, and we're troubled naturally as human beings. We're burdened about all kinds of things. And Jesus says, if you will get to know the Father like I'm introducing you to who? I'll give you rest. Because this relationship with the Father and the Son that I'm introducing you to, it's easy. It's actually not heavy to carry. And you'll find that you can rest when you get to know the Father. Now that is just one of 53 times in the New Testament when Jesus talks about his father. That's just one. This is an English search online about the English times in in the English Bible when it says, when he said, my father, 53 times. He's talking about his father all the time. In fact, here is an interesting study that I would recommend for those of you that like to do personal Bible study. Go and uh, look at these 53 times and and discern what he's saying about the Father. He's talking about the Father a lot. In fact, if uh, any of you would like to do this study, you're not sure where to look up these 53 verses, uh, if you will come and see me after the service, I'll take your name down, and I'll print out for you from the, the, the computer program the 53 places, and you can take a look. And you read the scriptures and Listen to what Jesus is saying about this father that he's introducing you and me to. What is this father like? Now, here's the next interesting thing. 22 times in the Bible, Jesus says, God is your father. Now, that is fascinating. Now, Jesus, as the son, has his identity in the father in the Trinity. His identity as son is because he has a father. And now he's saying to us, he's your father. So your identity as a son or a daughter gets clearer when you understand who your heavenly father is. And he's inviting us into this understanding of what it means to have a heavenly father. And so he's helping us to understand that the real image of father is not your dad. That was just a metaphor to get you started. What he's wanting you to understand is the real heavenly father. Because it's this father that actually created the cosmos. It's this father that actually gives you life. The human father actually has no power to do that. Simply an agent operating within the principles 
of God's creation. It's the heavenly Father that gave you an eternal soul. It's the heavenly Father that breathed that eternal life into you. And Jesus is saying, you need to get to know your Father. Because when you know him, you will understand who you are. And as just as Jesus' identity is clarified because he's talking about the Father, so it is for you and me. For us to find out who we really are, we need to understand our Heavenly Father. And, Jesus, and later in the, in the scripture, the Bible uses the words that we can be adopted as sons and daughters. We're invited into this family. That's amazing. So, Jesus says 22 times, he's your father. Be good to look at those verses. What does he mean when he's saying your father? What's he talking about when he says he's your father? And then, <clears throat> we do another search, and that in the Bible, in the English translation of the NIV, when we look for God as our father, that phrase, our father, Jesus uses it once when he says, our father. Do you know when that was? The Lord's Prayer. That's the one time he said, our father. And he uses that word as a model for us. The, the other 11 times happen in the letters following the gospels where the disciples are starting to get it. And they talk about our father, the father and Lord of Jesus Christ. And so we're talking about understanding a new identity by looking at the Trinity, by understanding the relationship between Father and Son and catching the the warmth of the Spirit. This is when we begin to understand who we really are. And we are shifting our identity from saying, well, I am the son or the daughter of so-and-so. And And this father, this earthly father, was good or maybe he was not good. Or maybe he was a mix. And instead of having an identity based upon what happened with an earthly father, which may or may not be good, Jesus is inviting us to shift our attention to a heavenly father. And so it actually doesn't matter what kind of a dad you had. You're not a victim. You are the son or the daughter of a heavenly father. And he will bring a healing to your soul as you come to understand and see him as your father. And Jesus says, when you begin to get it, you will find rest for your soul. Because you will know that you are loved. You will know that God created a good person. You will know that he is committed to you and that he has promised to be with you. You will know that he has said, I will never abandon you. You will know that he he will say to you, you are my beloved son or my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And you'll begin to understand what it means to have his life in the spirit flowing in you. Oh, dear people. God as our Father is a tremendous invitation for us to enter into a whole new understanding of who we are. And now it's natural that our children's concept of God as Father begin with their experience with us. So we do have a responsibility, dads. But thankfully, God doesn't lay it all on us to be the only image of what it means to have God as your Father. Thankfully, it's a relief that God actually moves our attention to himself because none of us father perfectly. We all fall short because God actually never intended that we should be the full picture. We were just the beginning invitation for him to use with our children. I find that encouraging. Guys, we may not do it perfectly, We may not do every task that needs to be there, but if there's one thing our kids need to know, the most important thing is that you love them. And grandparents, you can do the same thing because I'm a grandpa too. And I love it when I can play with these little kids and they can know 
that there's a family that loves them and cares for them. Our youngest son, uh, just this year, became a, a parent, a foster parent. And maybe that was the reason that that video that I talked about earlier where the, the, foster, the foster child who'd had a whole bunch of dads and he wasn't sure what kind of dad God was. Now, my son is a foster dad. And I'm a foster granddad. And we are making sure that we can give a picture to these little, to little kids of what it means to have someone who loves you, disciplines you, shapes you, but most important, loves you. Because that will help them, that will help them understand when they hear later that God is a heavenly father, hopefully they will think of my son and me as father figures. But let's pray for all of us as we face this amazing responsibility. So God, our Father, we are stunned that you have invited us to call you Father because that word is full of relationship. It's full of intimacy. It's full of invitation and commitment. And oh God, as we have increasingly become content and at rest, knowing that you are our Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you give us a peace in our soul that the world cannot give. And you've told us to share this with others. And so today, Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing on the dads and the grandfathers in this congregation. And I pray that they will love their kids and grandkids with a warmth that will welcome those kids into an understanding of what it means to have a heavenly father. And in the midst of that, Lord, we thank you that we don't have to be perfect to do this. We thank you that you are faithful to help us all begin to see you as our Heavenly Father. And Lord, to look at your face, to understand you through the Scriptures and through what Jesus said about you is truly stunning. And out of gratitude and worship this morning, we say thank you, Heavenly Father. For it's in your Son's name, Jesus, that we have come to know you and are able to say this. Amen. And as we go, let's receive this benediction. God will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Amen. May it be so. God bless you.